Alhamdulillah, we reached verse number 43 of Surah at tawbah And just to, uh, to put this ayah into context, we were speaking about the Battle of Tabuk. And the Battle of Tabuk is a military expedition that took place after the conquest of Mecca. We mentioned in our previous sessions that after the conquering of Mecca, the Holy Prophet ﷺ receives intelligence that the Roman army, the Roman Empire, is planning an invasion of the Arabian Peninsula. And the Holy Prophet ﷺ calls upon his companions, he calls upon the Muslims to prepare to march towards the border the Roman, the border for, uh, of the uh, Roman Empire, and face off against the Romans. Now, as we read in the previous verses, there was a lot of reluctance. Many of the companions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ were unwilling to support him in this struggle. Many of the battles that were fought, if not all of them, they were being fought against Arab tribes in the outskirts of Medina. This was the first time where the Prophet is asking his companions to face off against a superpower, an advanced army like the Romans. Tabuk was also very far from Medina. So there was an unwillingness to leave Medina and many of them were farmers. They, they were preparing to harvest their crops. So there was an unwillingness to join the Holy Prophet So as we mentioned in our last session, many of the companions came to the Prophet and they made excuses. They asked the Prophet to excuse them from participating in this battle. And some of them, you know, they, they put forward, they put forth many different types of excuses and not only did they make excuses as to why they were not able to join? They would take an oath. They would swear by Allah that if they were able to, they would join. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them out and tells the Prophet that this is a lie. Now this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it sounds as though Allah is rebuking the Prophet. So, so what happens is the Prophet is preparing to leave and head towards Tabuk. Many companions ask the Prophet to excuse them. And these are the munafiqeen. The hypocrites are asking the Prophet to excuse them. And they give many reasons. Some say that I can't leave my farm unattended. You know, some may have mentioned family issues and so on and so forth. The Holy Prophet, وآله, what does he do? They ask him to grant them permission to stay behind and the prophet gives them permission to stay behind now why does the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa because allah in this verse he says god pardon you why did you allah is asking the prophet why did you grant them leave why did you give them permission to stay before it became clear to you who spoke the truth and who the liars were. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, when he gave the munafiqeen permission to stay behind, was the Prophet being naive? And is Allah rebuking the Prophet for being naive and you know giving in, you know, having his emotional side take over? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants us to hear this conversation between him and the Prophet. And the Prophet ﷺ, he grants permission to the hypocrites to stay behind for a reason. There was wisdom behind why the Prophet does this. Number one, so the Prophet ﷺ wasn't just believing them. The Prophet knew that these were hypocrites. Many of them had a track record for their lack of support. The Prophet ﷺ, in his wisdom, 
being a military commander, a military leader, he did not want the munafiqeen to join this expedition because they would inevitably affect the morale of his army. They would create problems. So the Holy Prophet ﷺ did not want to weaken the resolve of his army by allowing the munafiqeen to join. So this is one this is one reason that's given. Another reason that some scholars mention is that the Prophet ﷺ, he knew that they were not gonna join, whether he grants them permission to stay behind or he insists that he join that they join him. Because the munafiqeen are not, they don't respect the Prophet. Whether the Prophet tells them to join him or he grants them permission to stay behind, it's not going to have any effect. So the Holy Prophet essentially knows that his words are not going to have an effect. So some of the Mufassirin, they say that he does this to, to perhaps lessen their punishment. He knows that they're not going to join. So he grants them permission to stay. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why does he say, Afallahu Ank, that God pardon you? Did the Prophet make a mistake? It seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now here when Allah says, God pardon you, it doesn't mean that the Prophet got, you know, what Billah committed a sin or made a mistake. The Prophet ﷺ had his own strategy in exposing the munafiqeen. The fact that he allowed them to stay behind and you know, did not want them to affect the morale of his soldiers was one subtle way of exposing them. But it seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the Prophet to really expose them by showing that not only are they unwilling to join, even when I command them to join me, they're going to disobey and stay behind. God pardon you. You know, Sheikh uh, Ayatollah Sheikh Nasr al Makarim al Shirazi, he, uh, he gives the following example. He says that imagine there's someone who is abusing who's abusing your child, your son, and you have no power to stop him. And no one has any power to stop him. And say that you have a friend that tries to intervene and say, don't hit him. And then you as the parent, you say, no, no, let, let him, don't, don't stop him because I want to expose how evil this person is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the same thing with the Holy Prophet. He says, don't give them, don't, don't give them permission to, uh, to stay. Command them to join you and allow everyone to see how they disobey you, how bold they are in their disobedience. God pardon you. Why did you grant them leave? Why did you grant them leave before it became clear to you who spoke the truth and who were the liars? What was the Prophet ﷺ unaware of who the, the munafiqeen were? There's a conversation between Al Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida and Ma'moon. And Ma'moon he asks Imam al Rida this question. Imam al Rida alayhi salam. He says that the Prophet, through revelation, knew who, were the muna, who, knew who the munafiqeen were. But here when Allah says, حَتَّى So it will become clear to you who spoke the truth and who, who, were the, who the liars were. This is actually being, this is addressing the Muslims through the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to be known to the Muslims who the munafiqeen were. Now, in the next verse, 
You know, when you read ayah number 43, you may ask, why are these individuals not joining the Prophet? Is it because they're lazy? They don't want to travel this long distance? Are they afraid? What's, what's, their, what's the underlying reason behind their reluctance to join the Prophet? What we read in the next two verses. Allah in ayah number 44, he says, Allah says, those who believe in God and the last day ask of you no leave for striving with their wealth and their selves. And God knows the pious. The true mu'mineen, my dear brothers and sisters, they don't look for excuses. They don't look for ways to get out of supporting the Prophet. You know, the Battle of Tabuk was the only battle in which Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, did not participate in. Now this may come to a surprise to many of you. Many ask, what was Ali ibn Abi Talib doing that he did not participate in this battle? So we've already mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ grants permission. He notices many of the munafiqeen are asking permission to stay behind. Tabuk is a long distance away from Medina. The Prophet knows that he's going to be away for an extended amount of time. He also knows that in his absence, the munafiqeen may stage a coup. They may try to overthrow the government. So what does the Holy Prophet wisely do? He leaves the most trustworthy person behind. He leaves someone behind in Medina to ensure that the munafiqeen do not create any trouble, that they do not achieve what they're planning, that he frustrates their plot. So Anir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he sees the Prophet preparing to leave, he comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you allow me to join? Because Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, didn't, he initially didn't know why the Prophet was leaving him behind. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what does he say? He's, because some of the Sahaba, began to ridicule Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, many of them were very jealous of him. So they started to rejoice when they saw that the Prophet was leaving Ali behind. So they start to taunt Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, saying to him that, look, even the Prophet doesn't value you because if he did, he would have taken you with him to the Battle of Tabuk. So Amir al mumin when he hears this, it bothers him. So he goes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, why, why, do, why, why do you not want me to join you this time? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, what does he say? He says, Ya Ali, Ama tarva an takuna minni biman zilati haruna min Musa illa anna la nabiya ba'di. Oh Ali, don't you want to be to me? as Harun was to Musa, except that there is no prophet after me. Now, this is not the first time the prophet has made the statement. Even when the Muslims first arrived in Medina, during the Mu'akhat, when, when the prophet established brotherhood between the Muhajirin and the Ansar, he also mentions this. Here, the prophet mentions his, his unique relationship to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, Ali السلام, is, is left behind. And you find that Amir al muminin so you see the contrast. Amir al muminin is begging the Prophet to join him in Tabuk. The Munafiqeen are making excuses. They're making excuses as to why they can't join the Prophet. And they're because they're lying, they overcompensate. They say, Wallah, Ya Rasulullah, if we could join you, we would. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in ayah number, so some 
So many of the so these munafiqeen they're making excuses as to why they can't join. Now it's important to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that the we the followers of Ahlul Bayt. You know, there's a misconception that Shia Muslims do not respect any of the companions. They're always bashing and making disparaging remarks about the companions of the Prophet. On the contrary, brothers and sisters, there are many verses in the Quran where Allah praises the Sahaba. Many of them were very pious. There were some who were not able to participate in the battles and they actually had legitimate excuses. If you go in the same surah, in Surah at tawbah ayah number 92, and inshallah we'll expound on this further when we reach it. In ayah number 92, there were some poor companions of the Prophet who were eager to join the Prophet. So the ayah says, there is no blame on these this, this group of people. There were some among the companions of the Prophet, and we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we revere these companions. The poor Sahaba who came to the Prophet, and you know, they, they, were, they were poor, they didn't have horses. They didn't have, so they come to the Prophet and they ask the Prophet that we want to join you, but we don't have weapons. We don't have horses. Can you supply us with saddles, with horses, with weapons, so we can fight alongside you? Allah says, the Prophet, of course, he, he his resources were also limited. The Prophet, unfortunately, he had to tell them, that I don't have any weapons to give you. I don't have any horses to supply you with. What did these companions do? So I want you to see the contrast between some of the companions. Companions who are begging the Prophet to supply them with weapons and, and horses and transportation so they can fight when the Prophet tells them that he's not able to provide transportation or weapons for them they began to cry some of the companions were so righteous they were so pious they had so much love for the prophet that when they were not able to participate in the jihad alongside rasulullah the Quran says they weren't, it's not that they were relieved. You know, some of us, we might be relieved if the Prophet says, you, listen, you don't have to fight in this battle. We would probably feel relieved. Allah says, their, The tears were rolling down their cheeks. They were crying because they didn't have the tawfiq of joining the Prophet because of their financial situation. So it's important to always keep in mind that we always have to have a balanced approach. You know, some of us, we make these blanket statements about the companions that they betrayed the Prophet. Many of them did. Yes, there's no doubt about that. But we can't forget these Sahaba who were so loyal to the Prophet that they cried when they were not able to join. Now, one, one practical lesson, brothers and sisters, that we can learn from these verses you know, because the whole point of this is to extract practical lessons, is that, you know, sometimes, you know, we make excuses. We're able to do things, but we make excuses. For example, you know, some of us may live very close to the masjid, but we don't go to Friday prayer. Some of us, we have free time, but we don't further our Islamic education. If you want to know if you are truly a sincere person, ask yourself, do I make excuses for why I don't do something or am I looking for ways to participate? So for example, if you live close to the masjid and you don't attend Friday prayer, are you the person that's trying to figure out 
you know, how am I going to catch a ride? How am I going to, you know, trying to make time to attend? Or are you just giving reasons why you can't? So it's important for us to always be mindful of legitimate excuses and illegitimate excuses. So are, are we looking for reasons to go? Or are we looking for reasons not to go to the masjid? Or are we looking for reasons to further our Islamic education? Are we looking for ways to further our Islamic education? Or are we looking for you know, reasons why we can't dedicate that time? So we see this even among the companions of the Prophet. Some make excuses as to why they can't join the Prophet, and some are searching for ways in which they can participate. If we go to the next ayah, ayah number 46. So but before I continue with ayah number 46, we mentioned that these munafiqeen are not willing to join. Why don't they want to join the Prophet? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that innama yasta'dhinuka, ayah number 45, I'm sorry. إِنَّمَا يَسْتَأْذِنُكَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَارْتَابَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فَهُمْ فِي رَيْبِهِمْ يَتَرَدَّدُونَ Only they ask you of, they ask leave of you who don't believe in God and the last day, whose hearts are in doubt and so they waver in their doubt. So these Sahaba who are not willing to join the Prophet, it's not that they're lazy, brothers and sisters. It's not that you know they have legitimate excuses. There's a very serious reason. The reason is much deeper than that. It's not that they actually have family issues. It's not that they're lazy. Because when something is a priority to them, they're not lazy. What's the reason why they refuse to join the Prophet? It's because of their aqidah. There's a deficiency in their faith. It's not that they're lazy. They don't believe in God. And nor do they believe in the hereafter. It's easy, brothers and sisters, to talk about God, to say that you believe in God, to say that you believe in life after death. But there are times in life where that belief will be challenged. And when you have to sacrifice, that's when that belief is challenged. So Allah reminds the Prophet, He reminds all of us that talk is cheap. These munafiqeen, they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. These munafiqeen, you know, they recite Quran, they pray, they do all of these things. But aqidah, your beliefs are not just things that should just reside in your mind. They have to be reflected in your behavior. So this unwillingness to sacrifice stems from their lack of belief in God and the hereafter. Ayah number 46. Allah says, and had they desired to go forth, they would have made some preparations for it. But God was averse to their being sent forth. So he held them back. And it was said to them, stay back with those who stay back. These companions, they say to the Prophet that, Wallah, if we were able to join, we would have joined. They mentioned that we're, we have to stay behind because of the following reasons. Allah says this is not true. If they were truly willing and if they truly desired to join you, they would have prepared. Their horses would have been ready. Their, their weapons would have been ready. But because they made no preparations to leave Medina and to go towards Tabuk, this is an indication that they had no desire of joining you, Ya Rasulullah. They had no intent and no intention of supporting you and joining you on this mission. Now, 
Allah says, وَلَوْ أَرَادُوا الْخُرُوجَ لَأَعَدُّوا لَهُ عُدَّةً وَلَكِنْ كَرِهَ اللَّهُ بِعَاثًا But Allah was averse to their being sent forth. So He held them back. Now you may ask, why does Allah say that He held them back? Did Allah rob them of their free will? The answer here, brothers and sisters, this is an issue relating to tawfiq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sees that someone is not interested in doing good, performing a righteous deed, Allah strips away the tawfiq from them. It reminds me, brothers and sisters, of, a, uh, of an incident that actually happened with me. I, and I'll never forget this. In 2006, I was in Mecca. We were performing Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the tawfiq to go to Mecca and perform Hajj and Umrah. So in 2006, I was in Mecca. And we were, for those of you who've been to Mecca, we were in the Aziziya district, which, you know, many of the, the Shias, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they stay there. And it's not walking distance to the, the Haram. So we had to take a taxi. So the taxi driver pulled up and we got into the, the cab. And as soon as we entered the cab, we said, Salamu alaykum hajji. We just assumed that the driver was, uh, was from hajj. And the man immediately said that I'm, I've never, I'm not a hajj, I've never performed hajj. You know, because he had a, a Saudi accent, we asked him that, don't you live in Saudi Arabia? And he was maybe 50 years old. He says, yes, I, was, uh, I live in Mecca. He says, I live in Mecca. I was born, raised, and I've been living in Mecca all my life. And he's never been to Hajj. Can you imagine that? And then you have people from the furthest parts of the 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 Indian subcontinent, parts of Africa, all around the world, who come and perform Hajj. And this man who lives in Mecca has never performed Hajj. This is an example of not having tawfiq. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he saw that these companions had no desire to join the Prophet, Allah says, I held them back. I stripped them of the tawfiq of supporting the Holy Prophet So if you, you know, sometimes having the intention to do good, you truly have the intention to do good, and you make the preparations. See, that's the problem, brothers and sisters. Some of us, we have good intentions, but we don't make preparations. Allah says that if you make the intention, and you prepare, you put in some effort, Allah will give you the tawfiq. But if there's no intention to do good, or if if there's no effort, no preparations are made, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'll hold you back. I will prevent you. I will strip you of tawfiq. And therefore the Prophet says to them, stay behind with those who stay behind. Stay behind with the women, the children, the elderly, those who are exempt from jihad. Now you may ask, why does Allah not want them to join? Because the ayah says, وَلَكِنْ كَرِهَ اللَّهُ بِعَاثُمُ Allah was averse to them being sent forth. Why does Allah not want these individuals to, remain, uh, to join? Allah answers in the, in the following verse. Ayah number 47. لَوْ خَرَجُوا فِيكُمْ مَا زَادُوكُمْ إِلَّا خَبَالًا وَلَا أَوْضَعُوا خِلَالَكُمْ يَبْغُونَكُمُ الْفِتْنَةَ وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّاعُونَ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ It's a very alarming verse, brothers and sisters. When I was reading it today, it really gave me goosebumps. Allah says, and had they gone forth with you, meaning if these munafiqeen, if these sahaba who were unwilling to join if they had joined it would have increased you in nothing but troubles they would have only created problems if they were to join 
and they would have hurried about in your midst seeking to incite discord among you. And among you are some who hearken to them, and God knows the wrongdoers. The word khibalan literally means to create confusion and disunity. So the Prophet ﷺ, as we mentioned earlier, he was actually very wise to grant them permission to stay behind. It was in the same way Imam al Hussein salam, you know, he gave permission to people to leave because the Imam only wanted the, the most committed, the most pious to be with him. Rasulullah knows that we're going to fight a superpower. I cannot afford to have munafiqeen with us. I only want the elite, the most devout, the most steadfast to be among us. And if you look at the verse, brothers and sisters, Allah says, وَفِيكُمْ وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّعُونَ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالظَّالِمِينَ Now the translation here is, and, and among you are those who listen to them or hearken to them. Some of the mufassireen, they say the meaning of وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّعُونَ لَهُمْ is that among the companions of the Prophet, there were informants. There were individuals who were delivering information to the munafiqeen about the Prophet. And that's why, brothers and sisters, it's shocking to me. I really believe that those who are shocked about what happened after the death of the Prophet, it seems that they have never studied Surah at tawbah Allah is telling us in this ayah that among the companions there are munafiqeen and there are those who the muslims don't even know that they're munafiqeen and they are informants meaning they're working against the prophet some of you are influenced by these munafiqeen some of you are informants and then what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Wallahu bil-zalimin. And Allah knows the wrongdoers. Yes, there are zalimin among the companions. We're, you know, we're not we're not speaking about kuffar here, brothers and sisters. We're not speaking about Ahlul Kitab. We're speaking about the individuals who are praying with the Prophet, who are with the Prophet in the battlefields, who are companions of the Prophet who are apparently Muslims. They're, some of them are acting as informants for the munafiqeen. Now you may ask, you know, the beautiful thing about the Qur'an is, brothers and sisters, that if you ask the right questions, if you read the Qur'an and you reflect, the next verse will typically answer the questions that you have. Now you may ask, this problem of munafiqeen, is it something, is, is this a new phenomenon? Is this something that happened just after the conquest of Mecca? Allah says, no. Allah in ayah number 48, he says, لَقَدْ ابْتَغَوُ الْفِتْنَةَ مِنْ قَدْمِ وَقَلَّبُوا لَكَ الْأُمُورِ حَتَّى جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَظَهَرَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ وَهُمْ كَارِهُونَ And indeed, they sought to incite trials earlier, min qabl, meaning the problem of nifaq, of hypocrisy in the Muslim community is not a new phenomenon. That the munafiqeen, this is not just a, uh, a medinin phenomenon. The munafiqeen were active even in the past. This is not the first time that they're shying away from the struggle, Ya Rasulullah. You know, there's there are historical accounts that tell us, you know, we all know about the Battle of Uhud. Even before the Battle of Uhud, when the Prophet was heading towards the battlefield, Abdullah ibn Abi, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who was known as a munafiq, he was heading towards the battlefield with the Prophet, and halfway to the Battle of Uhud, him and his companions, they decide to turn back. They decide not to support the Prophet 
So many of these individuals actually have a track record for abandoning the Prophet. I want to share with you guys a few ahadith which is found in some of the most authentic Sunni sources. And, and some of those who failed to support the Prophet, some of those who abandoned the Prophet in his, in his hour of need, are very prominent figures in the Muslim world. And again, I leave the judgment to the listeners, and I'm only going to share with you the ahadith, and people can make their own conclusions. Ahmed ibn Hanbal, in his Musnad, Ahmed ibn Hanbal is a, a prominent Sunni scholar of hadith, and his book is not one of the six authentic books of hadith, but it's definitely a book that has a great deal of scholarly weight in the Sunni world. It's called Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And it's called Musnad because he mentions the Senad for all of his ahadith. He reports a tradition from Aisha. An A Aisha, Aisha reports. Akhbarani Abi, my father told me. Who's Aisha's father? Abu Bakr is her father. Qala kuntu fi awwali man fa'a yawma uhud. Abu Bakr tells his daughter, he admits that I was among the first ones to flee in the battle of Uhud. And I swear to you, brothers and sisters, this is not Bihar al-Anwar, this is not al-Kafi. This is from the individual himself, from his daughter, in Muslim ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal. That he says, I was among the first. Kuntu fi awwali manfa. I was among the first to flee in the battle of Uhud. And then he says, and this is interesting. Faraaytu rajulan. He says, when I was running away, I saw a man fighting alongside the Prophet and defending him. Now my question here is, why didn't you name him? This shows you, brothers and sisters, that there are many who are reluctant and hesitant and made a concerted effort to, to not give Ali ibn Abi Talib his due credit. He says, I saw a man defending the messenger. رَأَيْتُ رَجُلًا مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ يُقَاتِلُ دُونَا So this is Musnad Ahmed ibn Ahmed, uh, the Musnad of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. In Sahih al-Bukhari and in Sahih Muslim, it mentions that Umar ibn al-Khattab fled. You know, we were speaking about the Battle of Hunayn earlier in this surah. Bukhari and Muslim mention specifically by name that Umar ibn al-Khattab was among the ones who fled in the Battle of Hunayn. It's documented. So you see... We have examples of some very prominent companions who abandoned the Holy Prophet in his time of need. Uthman, Uthman ibn Affan was also among the ones who fled in the battle of Uhud. When Rasulullah was on his deathbed, he was on vacation. He wasn't even in Medina, he was on a holiday. You would think that the Prophet is ill, he's sick, that those who loved him and cared for him would be around his deathbed, but they were in their own world. On the in Sahih al Bukhari, in Sahih Muslim, you know, because there's always this accusation against the followers of Ahlul Bayt that you guys, you know, believe you guys disrespect the companions of the Prophet. There's a narration in Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet explicitly says, Fi ashabithna ashara munafiqan. From among my companions, there are 12. Now we believe the number is, is definitely more than that. We believe there are 12. He says, Among my companions, there are 12 munafiqeen. Now this is during the, 
lifetime of the Prophet, their nifaq was apparent. There are 12 hypocrites from among my companions. Rasulullah says, Eight of them, eight among those twelve munafiqeen, they will they will never enter paradise until a camel can go through the eye of a needle, meaning that they're never going to go to Jannah. So that means at least eight of the companions of the Prophet Rasulullah says they're Jahannam. So then, how can you how do you reconcile this? With the ahadith that's mentioned in the books of our Sunni brothers and sisters that says, My companions are like stars. Whichever one you follow among them, you'll be guided. Rasulullah says, Eight, 12 of them are munafiqeen, eight of them are going to be in Jahannam. So, how are they guiding stars? And then you find in Bukhari, you know, because this surah, brothers and sisters, it's significant because it really puts a lot of what happened it contextualizes what happened after the death of the prophet it seems that the conspiracies are already at play the plots are already being made the prophet is already being disobeyed bukhari narrates that on the day of judgment the prophet will see some of his companions and he will call out to them and they will be taken away. They will try to come near the Prophet, the Malaika, the angels of punishment. They will drag them and take them to Jahannam. Rasulullah will say, Ya Rabbi Usayhabi, O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, they were my companions. Fayuqal, it will be said to the Prophet, Inna kala tadri ma ahdathu ba'dak. Ya Rasulullah, you do not know what they did after you. Now this is mentioned in Bukhari, meaning that there were some serious crimes committed after the Prophet. And finally, I'll conclude with this. On the way back from Tabuk, now the Battle of Tabuk never took place. The, Roman, the Romans never ended up fighting, and it seems that the uh, the intelligence that the Prophet received wasn't entirely accurate. When the Prophet was returning from Tabuk towards Medina, there was an assassination attempt. And this is also mentioned in Sunni sources. The hadith, and I'll read it to you verbatim. The Prophet was riding on his camel, and they were coming they were near a cliff because you know, it was a mountainous area and Hudayfa, one of the companions of the prophet was guiding the camel from the front Ahmad ibn Yasir was guiding it from behind the prophet was sitting on the camel the, the narration says there came a group of men and these were among the companions there were a group of men who came towards the prophet riding their camels and their faces were covered so these munafiqeen who are with the prophet they're technically companions of the prophet they have their faces covered they brought their camels and they were trying to scare the camel of the Prophet so the camel would panic and it would throw Rasulullah off of his camel and off of the cliff. Ammar ibn Yasir attacks them and then pushes them away. The companions, they ask the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, who were these munafiqeen? He says, yes, these were munafiqeen. And the Prophet says, do you know what they were trying to do? They were trying, he tells them that they were trying to frighten my camel so the camel would throw me off of the cliff. Now, I ask you, brothers and sisters, based on this hadith, and there are many different variations of this hadith, 
based on this hadith, who tried to kill the Prophet? You have munafiqeen. And what the definition of a munafiq is what? Someone who pretends to be a believer but is hiding their kufr, hiding their disbelief. A kafir is openly, op is the, a kafir, a disbeliever openly rejects. These are munafiqeen, these are companions of the Prophet who disguise themselves and attempt to assassinate the Prophet So this goes to show you brothers and sisters that the problem of hypocrisy was a serious problem up until the last days of the Prophet. There were individuals in the ranks of the Muslims who were constantly making excuses as to why they couldn't join the Prophet in battle. They would lie to the Prophet and say, we swear by God that if we were able to, we would have joined you. Allah says that the Allah says I took the tawfiq away from them so that they couldn't join you because if they did, they would they would uh, incite discord. And I cited many examples of the track record of some of the companions and how they failed the Prophet, how they abandoned him in his time of need, and even on the Prophet's way back from Tabuk, these munafiqeen, they it seems like they heard that the Prophet is approaching. Medina and they sought to eliminate him to assassinate him we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin are there any questions or comments uh, uh, is the story about the assassination attempt mentioned in Sunni books? Yes, it's actually, I actually have it uh, on my phone. Let me just uh, pull it up real quick. Yeah, it's it's actually mentioned, uh, I, I actually wrote this from a, from a Sunni source. Let me just, uh, I had it. Does the... Uh, I imagine the, the the brother or sister wants uh, the actual source, correct? Uh, yes. So the uh, so this is mentioned in uh, in Musnad Ahmed ibn Hanbal. That's the source. And for those of you who want the the hadith number, it's hadith twenty. Hadith number 22,676. It's also mentioned by Al Haythami in Majma' al Zawa'id, volume 1, page 110. So, yeah, that the assassination attempt is mentioned uh, in Musnad, Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Thank you. And uh, on the in the verse where it says that among you are those who listen to the monophics, does the verse say that the ones who listen to the monophicine are informants? Or if it doesn't say that, then why do we believe that there were informants versus someone who was just easily influenced by the monophicine? So you so verse number forty-seven, right? Wafikum samma'un lahum. Because the the word sama, it can ha, it, it it has more than one meaning. It could mean someone who's malleable, someone who's easily influenced, or it could mean it's also a valid interpretation that you know uh, some of them uh, are are informants. You know, they they basically they uh, they listen with the intention with, with they listen as informants to pass on information. So it, it it comes just from the uh, the uh, the word samaun alam because the word sama can uh, has that connotation can convey this idea of uh, being an informant. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum. Uh, the hadith is, uh, which you men mentioned about uh, the companions running away from the battlefield. Yeah. So can you please uh, give the reference of which volume and which number? Yes. 
So So the narration that I mentioned from uh, from Aisha, where her father informs her that he was among the first to flee in the Battle of Uhud, that's also uh, uh, in uh, Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and it's under the section of Fadail al-Sahaba, the merits of the companions. Now, I don't, I don't know why that would be under the merits of the companions, but uh, it's uh, it's under uh, it's under that. Uh, section i don't have the and oh it's a uh, hadith 242 now again i'm going off of the uh the app on my phone the if you go to an actual book the hadith number might be different but i i think if even if you do a uh uh if you go online and just search for the hadith uh in uh muslim and ahmed and muhammad because i know some of these sites have search engines you can uh you can find it especially under the battle of uhud he has a section under the Battle of Uhud, and you'll find uh, that hadith. And for uh, the, so for the battle, I mentioned that uh, Bukhari and Muslim also mentioned uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab fleeing in the Battle of, uh, of Hunayn, and this is, uh, this is mentioned in, uh, in Bukhari, and it's under the section on Khums, and it's Hadith 2909. So that's in Bukhari. And in Sahih Muslim, it's under the section on Al Jihad was saved, Jihad and, uh, and traveling. Hadith number 3295. And uh, did you say that there was a similar hadith about Umar also fleeing the battlefield? Or, yeah. or sorry, uh, Osman fleeing, fleeing the battlefield? No. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to look up uh, an actual source, but uh, let me see. Uh, I, I actually. Yeah, so, so Uthman fleeing in the Battle of Uhud is also mentioned uh, in Sahih al Bukhari, uh, hadith number 3000. 422 and it's it's under the section of manaqib which means like the merits and there's a specific specific section called manaqib uthman the merits of of uthman and I, I just think it's the irony that these ahadith are mentioned under the sections of merits you know so allah alam why it's kind of categorized in that way but perhaps you know maybe they saw that they consider that he repented or he he paid the kafara by being so great later on according to them but you know, it's uh yeah it's it's all it's all recorded in these uh these sources but unfortunately as i always say people don't read people just you know listen to this speaker and that speaker and there's no real research that takes place anymore uh, Sheikh, I have uh, one more question. Uh, why was uh, Khalid bin uh, Walid given uh, the title of Sayfullah? Well, so this is uh, he was not given this title by the uh, the Prophet. This is this is a title that was given to him by others. And uh, Khalid ibn Walid, there's no doubt that he was he was a courageous warrior. But he also had instances where, where he demonstrated uh, weakness in the battlefield. Now, if you look at, uh, now I don't know specifically who gave him that title, but definitely the Prophet didn't give him that title. After the, uh, the death of the Holy Prophet Khalid was actually used by Abu Bakr to fight against those who refused to pay him zakat. You know, in the Ridda Wars, and the Prophet and Abu Bakr considered those who refused to pay zakat as apostates. So he would dispatch these uh, these brigades to forcefully take zakat from those who refused to pay zakat. And Khalid ibn Walid was one of the commanders. And Khalid 
you know, he killed a number of people. He killed, it's well documented, that Khalid ibn al-Walid killed Malik ibn Nuwayra, who was a companion of the Prophet. You know, so if people want to talk about, you know, disrespect of the companions, you know, let's talk about Khalid, who actually killed a Sahabi. Not only did Khalid ibn al-Walid kill a companion of the Prophet, he actually rapes the wife of Malik ibn Nuwayra. Khalid ibn al-Walid is actually one of the individuals who physically assaulted Fatima to Zahra. And Muslims wonder why, you know, why, why, why we're so behind, why we're so backwards. Because these are the types of figures that Muslims revere. They don't do their research. They turn a blind eye to the genocide, the persecution that these individu individuals committed. So perhaps he was called the unsheathed because Sayyidullah al-Maslul means the unsheathed sword of God. You know, as though, you know, when he strikes, it's, it's the hand of God that's coming down on you. And it's to give him legitimacy, to basically say that wh whoever this person fights is an enemy of God. So it's a way of kind of, you know, uh, labeling, you know, Ahlul Bayt and those who opposed the Khulafa as, uh, as renegades. Um. Amar uh, was also brutally assassinated uh, by Muawiya, and uh, he's also called revered as um, um, this Razi Allah one. Who... Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are so many contradictions. You know, it seems like paradise is full of the murdered and the murderers. So yeah, it's it's very unfortunate. I mean. You know, Amar ibn Yasir is an example. If you look at uh, Hijr ibn Adi, he's also an example. Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, we don't, Abu Dhar is very well known. He dies in the, the deserts alone. Why? Because he was banished by Uthman. So the, the companions have a lot of blood on their hands. So it's very unfortunate that the followers of Ahlul Bayt, you know, they're criticized for their position. On the companions of the Prophet, when our our position is what the Quran says, some of them are pious and some of them are not. Some of them committed heinous crimes. Some of them deviated, and that's why I wanted to make it a point today by referring to ayah number ninety-two of Surah at Tawbah that some of them were very pious. Some of the Sahaba really supported the Prophet and they were committed to him. They were devout, and when when they were unable to help the Prophet, they would cry because they missed out on that opportunity. Those who were killed in Uhud and in Badr and the other battles, they're companions who we honor, we respect and we revere. But they, they, it's, it is impossible to deny that there was a serious problem during the time of the Prophet in that there were many companions. An entire surah in the Quran was revealed called Surah Al-Munafiqun, the chapter of the hypocrites. And which tells you that, you know, we're not talking about a handful of people. That there's, you know, there's a, a mutiny that was forming. And these munafiqeen, they, they essentially took over after uh, the death of the Prophet.